we um, come back from lunch with a presentation by William Bouchon, who is the historian and webmaster of the White House Historical Association, where he's involved in all areas of American history, including material culture, uh, excuse me, material cultural research, urban history and preservation, historical and literary studies, political science, as well as the issues of race, class, and gender. For many years, he worked in Washington, D.C. as a historian with the National Register of Historic Places and as an independent author and historic preservation consultant. His major projects during those years included a, a historic resource study of Rock Creek Park, a lead research role in an exhibition on contemporary federal design from Mars to Main Street that opened here at the National Building Museum, and numerous publications, including North Carolina's Executive Mansion, The First 100 Years in 1991, uh, Uncle Sam's Architects, Builders of the Capitol in 1994, and an annotated edition of Glenn Brown's History of the United States Capitol in 2008. From 94 until 1997, Dr. Bouchong worked as a preservation planner with the Maryland National uh, Capital Parks and Planning Commission. He received a BA and MA history degrees from North Carolina State University and Appalachian State University before coming to Washington, D.C. to complete his doctoral studies in American civilization at the George Washington University in 1988. His talk today is entitled, The Personal Influence of Presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman on Washington Design. Please welcome Dr. Bouchon. See, good afternoon, <clears throat> and I uh, hope your lunch went well. Um, presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt and Harry Truman were two strong presidents with decided opinions on matters of design and boldly outspoken about them. President Roosevelt took a keen interest in architecture, and working with New York architects Henry Toombs and Eric Googler, had supervised several construction projects at Warm Springs, Georgia, and Hyde Park, New York including remodeling the family's mansion and Eleanor Roosevelt's Val Kill factories and cottages. The president was comfortable in the company of architects and artists and was famous for dashing off sketches to convey his design ideas. One of the central concerns of FDR's presidency was the expansion of executive office space and reorganization of the grounds of the White House. Likewise, Truman would be anxious to solve the issue of executive office space for the burgeoning executive branch that he had <clears throat> and had his own decided ideas about architecture, including adding the famous Truman balcony that, uh, as well as far more significant changes to the historic White House. The West Wing expansion, the construction of the East Wing, and the landscaping programs for the grounds that we heard a little about this morning already were all conceived or built or put into effect under Roosevelt and they were ambitious and high-profile high federal, high federal projects. Truman's balcony addition and the renovation of the White House were no less significant or symbolic. All required the review of the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts, and the decisions made by its members greatly impacted the history of the commission. An understanding of the personal design interests and the degree to which these presidents involved themselves in White House projects also reflects on their broader interest in overseeing the design of the Capitol. It is the interaction of these presidents and the members of the Fine Arts Commission that forms the core of what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon <clears throat> and their influence on federal design. Early in uh, December 1933, just to give you a sense of the amount of work that uh, was going on in Washington and what President Roosevelt was involved with in terms of decision making. President Roosevelt <clears throat> had uh, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes talk over the matter of a plan for new public buildings in Washington with the Chairman of the Commission of Fine Arts, Charles Moore. The meeting allowed Moore the opportunity to emphasize the need to locate the public buildings adjacent to the White House as contemplated in the Macmillan Plan of 1901. Ickes was most interested in the location for a new Interior Department building and the site suggested by Moore was at 19th and Pennsylvania Avenue which pleased the Interior Secretary. Moore also pressed Ickes to consider the recommendation of the Commission to site new War and Navy Department buildings west of the White House 
on Pennsylvania Avenue and arranged for a conference with the President to be held on December 7th. Moore reported that the meeting was highly successful and that the President was in full accord with the Commission's suggestion to create an executive group with the White House at its center, just as the Capitol was at the center of a legislative group. Well, I think uh, already uh, <clears throat> you've heard today that nothing in Washington planning could ever be that easy. And the conflict between the dispersal or concentrations or bu of public buildings would be something that would wage for many decades afterwards. Moore expressed the opinion at that time that, he, that to, to complete the uh, executive group with, the, with it, <clears throat> what needed to happen was the Treasury Department annex would need to be extended northward to H Street on the west side of Lafayette Square would be built a State Department building. Of course, Moore wished to revive another scheme that we saw earlier today uh, that uh, Pope first worked on in 1917, but then this uh, drawing by Waddy Wood in 1930 was yet another iteration of that. The idea, of course, being that you would convert the old State War Navy building into a neoclassical structure to match the Treasury Department, providing the off the president with ample executive office space. All plans for the new buildings would be stalled as Congress <clears throat> um, halted uh, new construction as part of an emergency public works law. The fate of the projects, the new war Navy departments eventually would settle in the, at the Pentagon in Virginia against the protests of the commission. The State Department occupied a massive limestone structure in Foggy Bottom. The State War Navy building would be adaptively reused as the executive office building. The interior department would be built closer to the White House, but between 18th and 19th streets, but would not face Pennsylvania Avenue as Moore had advised. The Treasury Annex, of course, was not extended on Lafayette Square. In fact, President Roosevelt had a hand in the preservation of the area <clears throat> by rejecting art modern designs for state department annex on the west side of Lafayette Square. He favored more traditional design for the federal offices there, along with uh, he made a statement to, for the preservation of Blair and Decatur houses in 1942. However, the apex building that uh, was discussed was, uh, <clears throat> was built in accordance with the federal triangle plans and was well, that were well under development by 1933. During his deliberations with Moore during that winter of 1933 and 1934, President Roosevelt requested the Commission's opinion about a proposal for a memorial to Thomas Jefferson to be erected on the east end of, the, of a triangular point of the office group on Pennsylvania Avenue. The President also made an odd request <clears throat> that uh, the statue of Andrew Jackson be removed from Lafayette Park because it was a rather strange rearing horse. Moore was able to <clears throat> persuade the president that the apex building would be vital to the composition of the triangle buildings and that the Jackson statue should stay put and, uh, of course, went back to the old playbook of the, uh, the great members of the, 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 uh, the 1901 commission, quoting Augustus St. Gaudens that uh, he would be sorry to see it moved from its present location because it had grown into its place. FDR obviously had a role in many decisions that influenced the history of public buildings programs in the New Deal era. It's a huge topic and beyond the, what uh, I would like to do today in terms of connecting the presidents to the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts. What occupied FDR's interest most and brought <clears throat> him into contact with the commissioners personally most often was the White House and its environs and those projects there. With the great increase of his New Deal staff in the 1930s, President Roosevelt was looking for a solution to the cramped executive office space, one that Congress would fund, and, one, and secondly, that the American public would accept. And the first two solutions for the executive office, as you can see on the screen, and if I can figure out how to use the little red button, but... Uh, Okay. Anyway, on the left you see the 1902 annex uh, that was developed by McKim, Mead, and White as part of the Roosevelt Restoration. And then on the right, the 1909 uh, expansion. And uh, right down the middle of the, of the uh, building there where you see the light, uh, the sort of entryway underneath at the basement level, that's about the point or the hinge where the building was doubled in size and the bow that you see in the center, that was the first Oval Office. 
<clears throat> anyway, with that uh, building on your right in mind, Roosevelt began to explore his options for a major new expansion of the West Wing. He conferred with a government architect named Lorenzo Winslow. Winslow was the designer of a swimming pool that had been built in the West Terrace in 1933, and he had gained the president's trust and confidence. As a government architect with the Office of Public Buildings and Public Parks, Winslow had been assigned to assist in the design of the indoor swimming pool, but soon became known around the White House as the fixer. And during the 30s, Winslow was transferred to the Public Buildings Administration and assigned to the White House, modernizing the kitchen, workrooms, and service rooms, as well as working with the president on the redesign of a, of, of a library. In 1940, President Roosevelt would formalize Winslow's position as architect of the White House, and he culminated his career as a public architect, directing design services for the Truman renovation between 1948 and 1952. Winslow was born in Massachusetts in 1892 and had attended architecture school at MIT. He worked as a draftsman in Boston, fought in World War II, and after the, I'm sorry, World War I, and after the war settled in Greensboro, North Carolina where he worked as a draftsman for Harry K. Barton, and then the A.K. Moore Realty Company as a sort of a captive architect for that company. He then opened an independent practice and designed departments, houses in the Georgian and Tudor styles. And at the outset of the Depression, he migrated north to Washington like many young architects who sought work in the public sector. The Commission of Fine Arts' first knowledge of the president's shift in office plans came from the president's uncle, Frederick A. Delano, the president and chairman of the National Capital Park and Planning Commission, who had shared Winslow's sketches of plans to enlarge the executive office to over 31,000 square feet. A newspaper article on April 22, 1934, broke the news of FDR's plans the day before the commission met to consider the enlargement scheme. The commissioners noted that this project would be treated as a temporary proposition as just as the original annex had been in quote unquote the days of Theodore Roosevelt. Charles Moore, the influential chairman of the commission, publicly supported the president's wishes to expand the executive offices, announcing to the press that the offices should be enlarged as a temporary measure until such time that a renovation of the state war and navy building could be completed for use as an executive office. However, behind the scenes, he was meeting with a gifted young architect, Eric Googler of New York. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt probably had brought the young architect, Eric Googler, into the project as he had worked along with, with uh, Tombs at Val Kill and was a trusted advisor to Mrs. Roosevelt on the Arthur Dale Homestead Community Project. Googler had studied at the American Academy in Rome after finishing his courses in architecture at Columbia University. He was a devoted admirer of Charles McKim and a committed practitioner of the Beaux-Arts ideal of the past in architectural design. At the time of the executive office flap, he was practicing architecture independently as a partner, as his partner, Henry Toombs, had returned to his home state of Georgia. Googler had struck up a friendship with Moore on trips to Washington and take, that were taken to meet and to discuss the career and work of his idol, McKim. Moore was not pleased with Winslow's expansion plans, and according to Googler, when they met at the Cosmos Club one evening to discuss the president's plans, was almost in tears and at the end of his tether, fearing the president would adopt them. A meeting was arranged with FDR, and Moore tasked the handsome and charismatic architect to persuade the, archi to persuade the president to move the executive offices into the State War and Navy Department building and build a tunnel to connect the structures FDR dismissed the idea out of hand, noting his handicap and, and uh, his uh, need for an office space that was close to the White House, but he also cited the Secret Service's resistance, fearing that the president might get caught in a tunnel uh, and it would be a security risk. The president stressed his need for the convenience of adequate office space and called Moore an old fuddy-duddy. Googler continued to press his case against marring the architecture of the White House and proposed showing FDR a solution that would, be, uh, would solve the problem of the office space. In his memoir on the West Wing project, Googler re recalled, Henry Toombs and I both knew that FDR thought of himself as an architect in a way that we both excused. He was likely to credit himself with those parts of the work he especially liked. 
Henry and I, what with Georgia Hall and Little White House in Warm Springs and the work in Hyde Park, were used to this and almost always liked it and always forgave him. Googler developed and presented to the president and then the commission a solution for the expansion that skillfully concealed the large volume of space he would need to add. The commission made site visits to confer with Googler and met with the president and were always cordially received. President Roosevelt assured the commission that he intended to remodel the State War and Navy building, but money was not available and the need to enlarge the executive offices met a, a present emergency. The commission recommended Googler to the president to be the consulting architect. Now that's hardly a, a, a tough one given that he was so well known. And uh, the, the president, of course, responded saying he was delighted to approve Googler and noted, I tried a dozen plans to make the extension to the east fit in with the necessary ground floor arrangement, but it did, just did not work. That is why it seems absolutely necessar necessary to go back to the plan for expanding, extending it to the south. The president, of course, got his way, and Googler would def <coughs> actually develop his extension plan southward. <clears throat> the young architect had proposed a penthouse story and the excavation of a large sub subterranean office area. This included the basement beneath the exposed building and also expanded out to an equal area to the south with a light well that is now infilled. And you see the uh, sketch of that uh, area that uh, was done by Shell Lewis for Googler. And uh, all of that was infilled almost immediately uh, when uh, World War II broke out because of the, uh, the thought of danger from uh, uh, any sort of projectile that might come in there. As you can see, Googler planned a fountain and a fish pond with a lush garden with a courtyard bringing greenery, light, and air to these underground offices. He would also propose the major change of moving the Oval Office to its present southeast location adjacent to what today is the Rose Garden. His plans, rendered deftly with the presentation drawings by accomplished delineator Shell Lewis, were widely published in the press along with a photograph of the model of the expansion that unfortunately has been lost. On July 24, 1934, bids for the work were opened. The construction contract was awarded to M.P. Severin Company of Chicago in the amount of $303,087. Demolition of the old structure, with the exception of the north and west walls, began in August, and construction started on August 24, 1934. The contractors were given just 100 days to finish the job, which required construction to be carried on on a 24-hour basis. President Roosevelt and his staff temporarily worked in the cramp quarters in the White House or over in the State War and Navy Building across Executive Avenue. In October, the commission made a trip to inspect the work, escorted by Googler, you see a photograph of the construction under work with the uh, penthouse story that is outlined in uh, the steel, and then, of course, down where you saw the uh, rendering earlier of the light well. The commissioners toured the building with Googler, <clears throat> and they went to the main major spaces of, of, of the structure, the new Oval Office. You see the sketch by Googler uh, or uh, Shell Lewis above, and then the uh, um, actual Oval Office as it is today. My point here in showing you those photographs of the cabinet room and the Oval Office is that the integrity of those spaces is, is largely intact from the design of Googler. <clears throat> the other major space was a waiting room, which uh, sort of takes on an a, a, almost uh, um, sort of mythic character to it. This is the area where the press hung out and uh, would wait and sort of stalk and, and talk to various officials coming in and out of the White House at that time. Uh, this area no longer exists as this uh, large a volume. It has been cut up into smaller offices, and there's a smaller waiting area there today. The entire work on the uh, West Wing expansion was concluded in, on November 22, 1934. President Roosevelt, though, would keep the commissioners active, as you heard this morning uh, in the lecture related to uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Um, there was an interesting uh, case there where um, a rediscovery occurred. Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt had come across what was considered a confidential report that had been developed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. after discussions of the landscape issues uh, related to the White House. 
and had given his study to Colonel U.S. Grant III, the officer in charge of public buildings and grounds. The report had been given to Grace Coolidge and then passed on to Lou Hoover without eliciting any action. Mrs. Roosevelt came into possession of the uh, um, plans, and uh, he was seen aerial of the uh, White House in 1919, obviously before those plans would be considered. With the West Wing <coughs> expansion now nearly considered, um, uh, nearly completed, uh, the president decided he wanted to bring in Federal, Frederick Hall Olmsted for consultation about improving the grounds. So he invited Charles Moore, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., and Eric Googler, and they all jumped in his car and they drove around the White House grounds discussing Olmsted's design and, and the president would explain what he'd like to see achieved. The result of the meeting was the creation of a master plan for the development of the White House grounds by the National Park Service. This would take many years, but and uh, you see a photo, an image of the, uh, one of the Olmsted studies as well as what that view looks like uh, out over the balcony uh, from the roof of the White House. <clears throat> Once again, there were insufficient funds and only small improvements could be made to the grounds at that time. However, it uh, did establish uh, in the, uh, the, uh, a plan that was uh, embraced by the President, Mrs. Roosevelt, that the Park Service has continued to use as a guide ever since. A reflection of the early success of the relationship of Charles Moore and the Commission with the President uh, came in December 1934. Moore reported to his colleagues with no small measure of satisfaction that President Roosevelt has told Mr. Rudolph Forster, his executive clerk, that it was not necessary to bring a memorandum recommending the reappointment of Mr. Moore to him, but to go ahead and order it. The Commission chairman was in a heady mood and also noted that he had had <clears throat> several talks with the President recently, and he is much interested in the work of improving and developing the city of Washington. With Moore's leadership affirmed, the Commission seemed poised to continue its role as the city's arbiters of traditional taste. Edgerton swore out our favorite whipping boy today, would have something to say, and he said that uh, to, to the chairman that he thought it was vital that he continue on even though he felt he should step down due to his age, and said, at this time, it was, it, it, you are needed to help restrain advanced ideas in the fine arts that are now current. So we all know how that turned out. In 1934, Congress enacted legislation establishing the, the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Commission. The apex block at the Constitution and Pennsylvania Avenue site was still under consideration. It would take years of wrangling we heard about this morning before the Potomac Basin site was settled. The Commission's involvement with the Commission at first proved somewhat collegial since Moore attended the meetings and in 1935 actually guided the members around for their introductory trip to show them the, of, of the Commission to the Meridian Hill site to look over the city of Washington and then to go look at the site south of the Washington Monument suggested in the 1901 Macmillan Plan that had been de designated, of course, as the location for a memorial to the founders of the Republic. Moore reported to his colleagues <clears throat> that he was pleased that Fisk Kimball, uh, one of the most as we've heard, influential members of the, of the Jefferson Memorial Commission, that he had preferred the south of the Washington Monument location, and in Moore's words, so there is one member of the commission to give proper guidance. Relations between the commission, commissions obviously frayed badly, and we've heard about that, by 1938. Moore had stepped down as chairman, and uh, the, the uh, reason that he gave was, of course, his advanced age. He would be succeeded by landscape architect, civil engineer, and dean of the School of Architecture at Cornell University, Gilmore Clark. Clark had an illustrious career, including work on the design of the grounds of the Central Zoo, uh, the uh, expansion of Riverside Park, the grounds of the 1939 and 64 World Fairs in New York, and was an engineering and landscape uh, consultant for the Garden State Parkway. He was an accomplished practitioner and professor. He took a determined stand against the dome pantheon-like design that uh, John, Russell Moore, uh, John Russell Pope had created. He was so passionate about it, and we heard this early this morning, but I'll just quickly summarize again that uh, at, uh, saying to his groups, that, to, to, the, to his colleagues, the approval of the pantheon, <clears throat> uh, it was something he just couldn't do uh, as uh, conscientiously as individuals or as a group, or because their hearts and souls weren't in it. 
The site that uh, was chosen for the Jefferson Memorial, as you've, as you've seen, was uh, flat and uh, had a broad expanse along the Potomac River. And Clark stated that, the, that, the, that he felt that uh, it called for a low, broad architectural mass with a central axis open or partly open with the notable central figure dominating the surrounding sculpture. Clark and the commission, as we know, appealed to President Roosevelt to reconsider the monument design approved by the Jefferson Memorial Commission. Clark critiqued the design as a slavish copy of a building erected by the Emperor Hadrian, indefensibly pedantic, and cannot represent the modern social feelings and character of your administration and our time and suitably honor Jefferson. He further emphasized that it violated the interrelationships of L'Enfant's plan and the development of Washington today. Of course, the press reveled in this controversy, pointing out that the commission had no veto power as an advisory body and felt that it had lost prestige in a political hardball fight with the Jefferson Memorial Commission. Led by Congressman John J. Boylan of New York and architect and historian Fisk Kimball, the commission had finessed the appropriation hearings on the bill and, in Clark's view, withheld facts and grossly misrepresented others to win authorization of the Jefferson Memorial. The Commission of Fine Arts had been diminished by the conflict and had not even been invited to testify. As is well known, the president sided with the supporters of the proposed site and the Pantheon design, and Congress approved plans that, pu that had been publicly criticized by the Commission of Fine Arts. <clears throat> Cheers greeted President Roosevelt as he attended the groundbreaking exercises for the Jefferson Memorial on December 15, 1938. Addressing the nation by radio as he sat in his car, in the days to come, the millions of American citizens who each year visit the national capital will have a sense of gratitude that at last an adequate permanent memorial to Thomas Jefferson has been placed at, a, at this beautiful spot. There had been concern, as, you've, as you saw from the uh, political cartoons earlier, that there would be a major uh, protest over the uh, loss of the large number of cherry trees. So two weeks before the event, signs were posted on the grounds and uh, the stakes put out for space indicating where the new trees were to be, were to be planted. Protesters had chained themselves to the cherry trees and concerned women had marched on, on the White House. Just 50 yards from the signs, FDR parked his car and naturally the press speculated that the president had set this all up. <clears throat> the following May, <clears throat> um, a, uh, <clears throat> as a uh, vacancy on the commission arose, the president's uncle, Frederick A. Delano, wrote to set up a meeting with FDR to discuss his new appointment. His advice was to bring a local man onto the commission. And he would, in, his, in his letter he stated, I find, <clears throat> I find that the Commission of Fine Arts feel that they have been a good deal ignored and perhaps slighted. In other words, like all prima donnas, they are sensitive. I am, of course, anxious to meet the situation. There is not a single member of the commission who comes from Washington and, is exceedingly, and it is exceedingly important that at least one man on this commission should be sufficiently familiar with Washington so that his opinion would be of value. While the status of the commission at this time was well captured by Eleanor Roosevelt in a My Day column, uh, and there's just a, a view for uh, Hortizak uh, took in the 40s that gives you some idea of why the protesters were so riled up. <clears throat> she wrote in her, in her column uh, that uh, since Mr. Moore has retired, I have not had the pleasure of coming into the contact with the present chairman and the other members of the commission. And they've always been vague, but very important figures in the background as far as I'm concerned. To find our friend Mr. Paul Manship is one of the value, vague figures gives me great confidence for I have always looked upon this commission with, with awe. And that was an exclamation point with that. And then she said, the reason for this is that at any time they can object to whatever changes I want to make to the formal rooms of the White House, again with an exclamation point, to convey her tongue-in-cheek, um, uh, the, char the tongue-in-cheek character of that article. That's the, the, um, an oddity in the history of the Commission of Fine Arts is the Committee on White House Furnishings, that from the Hoover administration actually served as a subcommittee of the Commission of Fine Arts. That committee formed in 1925 with uh, First Lady Grace Coolidge's backing. And it was the first real recognition that the White House was also functioning as a museum. Its chairman for many years was Mrs. Harold I. Pratt, a Republican and furniture collector possessed of standard oil millions. 
During the Roosevelt administration, the committee was uh, reappointed and comprised of members of, of, of the uh, Fine Arts Commission, wealths, uh, the wives of wealthy donors, the chief usher of the White House, White House architect Lorenzo Winslow, and a representative from the President's executive office. At the request of uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winslow <coughs> uh, would prepare designs and supervise construction in 1942 of a new East Wing. Now, compared with all the uh, fuss and, uh, and palaver that went over the uh, West Wing expansion, this is rather, a rather quiet project, and that may have been due to the fact that there was secrecy surrounding the construction of a bomb shelter under the structure, as well as the fact that the uh, need for office space was absolutely dire at this time. Jefferson and Latrobe's original East Wing had been torn down in 1866 because of its poor condition. In 1902, McKim had constructed a new glass-enclosed terrace on those foundations and created an entrance for social functions with a port cochere for guests and carriages. There had been no changes to the wing for 40 years. The new east wing that would be added at the end of that terrace contained formal, a, a new formal entrance for guests, offices on the first and second floors, and of course the air raid shelter underground. When World War II had ended, the, uh, President Truman began to consider plans again to expand the executive offices that had been made in 1934. Already they were inadequate. In 1945, President Truman invited the members of the Commission of Fine Arts to the White House and greeted them all in the Blue Room. The Commission had new ideas and projects for a post-war program of development that had been promoted and an exhibition at the Corcoran Gallery of Art that traced the history of the 20th century planning in the national capital, and showcase projects that had been held in abeyance because of the war. The president's mind, of course, was on his own modernization plans for the White House, and it was not long before he led the group into the Red Room where a set of drawings rendered by Winslow, as you see some of, uh, an example of those <clears throat> on the screen, that depicted a major southward extension of the uh, executive offices that in the, present, in the president's words, met urgent needs. He then pointed out several features of the plans that he found vital. First, an auditorium that could seat more than 300 people with a rostrum equipped with broadcasting facilities. Likewise, the building expansion needed a press room to provide for more than 400 correspondents. Finally, there was a pressing need for offices for six key administrative assistants to the president that had actually, at that point, been using the State Department building across the street. Winslow exhibited his the elevations and noted the 145 southward extension along Executive Avenue would not exceed the south walls of the State Department and that the traditional architecture would be in keeping with the White House. The commission suggested minor design modifications, such as taking out some of the curves <clears throat> on the east facade, but approved the design in general. The meeting was followed by a letter to Winslow that outlined the suggested changes to the east elevation and then uh, drew his attention to uh, some refinements in the auditorium space and to study the interior for special needs of film, television, and radio broadcasts. Clark's letter ended congratulating Winslow for, quote, being able to provide the interior space required without serious encroachment on the White House grounds, unquote. Well, the President's launch of the office extension plans had gone smoothly with the Commission but the, the public's reaction to the announced plans created a storm of protest against the project. The president held a conference to rebut what he called a tempest in a teapot and jokingly invited the overzealous to chain themselves to the White House shrubs, a reference to the famous protesters of the Jefferson Memorial. Truman defended his plans as not being visible from Pennsylvania Avenue and read Gilmore Clark's letter publicly supporting the extension with design modifications. The inclusion, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the opponents used the uh, inclusion of a cafeteria and the conversion of part of the East Wing is in this uh, office scheme uh, as two examples of things that uh, were just totally objectionable. And as a result, the commission uh, recommended that both of those elements be abandoned. Opposition from professional architects and civic leaders was also fierce. And the argument that the White House would lose its character as a home resonated with the American public. The House of Representatives blocked construction by voting the, down the appropriation. The Commission of Fine Arts received its share of criticism for its support of the President's extension plan, but it maintained once again that the expansion was a temporary measure 
only suitable and, and uh, only until suitable offices could be provided elsewhere. The next White House improvement, suggested by President Truman, appeared a simple matter to him, but its ramifications would rock the Fine Arts Commission. The request, of course, was for the construction of a second floor balcony on the south portico of the White House where the President could retreat on warm summer evenings. Gilmore Clark recalled that the President had returned from Charlottesville where he had made a speech on the 4th of July and had been, uh, had been uh, impressed by the upper balcony of the quadrangle buildings at the University of Virginia. The Truman, the Truman Balcony controversy is one of the most famous events <clears throat> in the development of the White House's architecture. The controversy is so famous, I'll just provide a brief summary because it's really the aftermath of the project that is the most interest to us today. Truman presented the idea of a porch to Chief Usher Howell Krim and architect Lorenzo Winslow. The Chief Usher telephoned David Finley, director of the National Gallery of Art and a member of the Commission of Fine Arts since 1943. They were, had become good friends. Finley had been an active member of the White House Furnishings C Commission and, Cr and Krim considered him the perfect intermediary. Finley suggested a conference at the White House on July 29, 1947 with Krim, Winslow, Chairman of the Commission Gilmore Clark, and Architect Commissioner member Frederick V. Murphy to discuss the matter. The upshot of the meeting of, <clears throat> ended up with a course of action by the Commission that they had taken before when confronted by a thorny issue related to the White House's alteration. They recommended an architect of note who had previously worked at the White House. Eric Googler and William Adams Delano being the obvious candidates at this time, and ultimately Delano was called in. The trouble arose from the President's mistaken understanding that the Commission had approved its scheme with the stipulation that he hired Delano as a consultant. The Commission expected Delano to oppose the balcony and help them appease the President. However, the end around backfired as Delano sided with the President and proceeded to work with Winslow on a solution to adding the porch. The issue came to a head in November when Clark sent a detailed letter to the President explaining why the Commission could not support any alteration to the South Portico, as it seriously would mar not only the portico itself, but also the entire South facade. Truman's reply dripped with angry sarcasm. My understanding was that when the matter was discussed with you with regard to the rearrangement of the South Portico, that when Mr. Delano made up his mind, the solution would be satisfactory to you. Now you confess that you hoped he would make up his mind in a manner that you approved of and that you didn't enter into the matter at all with an open mind? That is a great statement for the chairman of the Commission of Fine Arts to send to the president. Truman did not accept Gilmore's argument that the alteration would be the first substantial change to the exterior of the White House in 118 years. The president noted that the dirty awnings are a perfect eyesore and bitterly complained that Clark did not take into consideration the, fa the presidential family in this arrangement. As we all know, the President was not deterred by the Commission and went on to build the Truman Balcony as, as it has become to be known. And here you see uh, the first day that the press were allowed to go take photographs. As news of the balcony and the Commissioner's opposition became public knowledge in, in, in 1948, Truman faced a storm of criticism from the architectural pr profession and the media. The President's back porch created a furor, but he persisted and the project quickly entered the political mainstream as editorials about the president's porch began to compare the project to his blustery presidential style and bandied terms around like back porch Harry and balcony statesmanship. After all the president's reputation for hard-headedness and unbending certainty that he was right was fair game in an election year. The whole episode was captured with great skill and humor in Jim Berryman's editorial cartoon published in the Washington Star in 1948. The citizen you see flicking his cigar ashes saying, suppose I don't renew the lease. The real casualty of the Truman Balcony controversy was the Commission of Fine Arts, who in the President's mind had launched an undercover attack after the project had begun and betrayed him. Truman's subsequent communications with the Commission were polite, but his brevity spoke volumes about his contempt for the agency. In November 1948, Clark wrote a conf confidential letter to David Finley to discuss the serious problem with the Commission's relations with the White House and the part the Commission should play in the reconstruction of the White House that was being contemplated by the President. Clark noted that Congress usually inserted the line, quote, shall have the approval of the Commission of Fine Arts, unquote. 
in legislation for all major important Washington building projects. After discussing in the letter the furnishings committee news and information and the impatience of the ladies who wanted to place the public rooms in good order and in keeping with the dictates of the period of the early republic, Clark joked about what the fallout might have been had the commission had veto power over the Truman balcony. He described just how sensitive relations had become. In the present circumstances, it seems to me, and I know you agree, wise not to kindle the fire of the president by suggesting in legislation any statement which might be drawn or traced back to our initiation. If we do have to tolerate for longer than the ladies, like the red plush on the chairs and the sofa of the Red Room. After the president's surprising reelection, <clears throat> the commission came clearly into the line of fire. In December 1948, Howell Krim, Winslow, Charles Barber, engineer with the Public Buildings Administration, and W.W. W. Reynolds, commissioner of public buildings, met with the commission to present drawings <clears throat> proposing, quote unquote, the fireproofing and alterations of the White House. The commission reviewed the plans and noted radical changes in the reconstruction in the North Entrance Hall and stairway and recorded that in view of the great public interest in the White House, an outstanding firm of architects should be appointed as consultants to prepare the architectural plans for the reconstruction of the White House, insomuch as they do not have confidence in Mr. Winslow's ability to prepare them. The latter point was again reiterated in a memorandum that was sent to the President entitled Restoration of the White House. The plans were withdrawn and no formal letter would be written until Clark had heard from Krim after his talk with the President. Well, you can imagine how that went down <clears throat> with this group. By the following June, Congress had enacted legislation for the renovation and modernization of the executive mansion that uh, realized Clark's fears. The bill established a commission comprised of senators, House members, and two <clears throat> advisors, engineer Richard Daughtry and architect Douglas Orr, both members of the committee that had investigated the structural condition of the White House and recommended its reconstruction. 80-year-old Senator Kenneth McKellar of Tennessee would be the chairman. Noticeably absent from the bill was any mention of design approval by the Commission of Fine Arts. In June 1950, the New York Times had led its article, Truman Shakes Up Arts Commission, with the lead. The artistic bombshell with a delayed action fuse was exploded by President Truman today. The president let the outgoing members dangle as their terms expired one by one and then in one fell swoop appointed four new members to replace the opponents of his celebrated balcony. Sculptor Felix G.W. DeWeldon of Washington, D.C. replaced William T. Aldrich of Boston. Joseph Hudnut of Cambridge, professor of architecture and dean of the faculty of design at Harvard University, succeeded Clark but did not assume the chairmanship. Edward F. Neald, Sr., a partner in the firm of Neald and Sondahl of Shreveport, Louisiana, succeeded Lee Lowry Eastern, of Eastern Maryland, and Pietro Belushi of Portland, Oregon, architect and engineer, took L. Andrew Reinhard of New York's place. Architect Frederick Murphy, a Washington architect, and Maurice Stern, a Russian-born New York sculptor, were also replaced as their terms expired by the year's end. The sole, survival of, sole survivor of the Truman balcony fight was David E. Finley, who would be appointed the new chairman. He had remained in the confidence of the White House through his active role in the White House Furnishings Committee, advising on the selection and acquisition of artwork and furnishings. The reaction to the Truman's modernizing of the commission uh, in the press ranged from articles about political payback to a concern that the commission might now follow a po policy of toadyism. The president publicly stated that changes were made because he wanted the commission in its capacity as an advisory body on public buildings and monuments to work with the National Capital Parks and Planning Commission in a dynamic combination. The Commission of Fine Arts, as you know, walks a fine line in its relationship with the president and Congress. Its power is one of persuasion and influence based on two fundamental principles, that the members serve without pay, it's public service and that there be no veto power. These principles were established in the 1910 legislation that founded the Commission of Fine Arts and required what they called judges of the fine arts who have professional qualifications, experience, and I should also add the courage of their convictions. The history of the, con of the commission and its dealings with the White House projects during the Roosevelt and Truman administrations reflect a calm before a stormy passage. 
ironically the agency that had grown out of a planning movement that claimed its first victory as the 1902 Roosevelt restoration of the White House was now on shaky ground because of the White House. Charles Moore had been at the center of that movement and his decades of distinguished service as the bearer of the torch of the, for the Macmillan Plan of 1901 and as chairman of the Commission of, Pro, uh, Commission of, of Fine Arts proved a difficult act to follow. He was a consummate Washington power broker who understood the politics of civic design. Clark, appointed by Herbert Hoover in 1932, maintained the highest standards of design and to his credit worked toward compromises surrounding the bitter controversies in Washington between the modern and traditional styles of architecture, sculpture, and painting. However, as we've seen, Clark had a confrontational style and uh, his ability to charm and persuade officials in power <clears throat> to accept the commission's advice does not appear to be as uh, uh, skilled as Charles Moore's. Moore may have been an old fuddy-duddy in 1933 when FDR entered office, but the president clearly respected Moore, who was, befri who was befriended by many powerful Washingtonians. In 1950, the commission had lost influence at the White House and had been largely shut out of the review of the complete reconstruction of the interior of the White House by an architect that they did not feel capable of that work. They also lost the trust of a president who suggested the commission's dynamic merger with the National Capital Park and Planning Commission that, by the way, was, uh, became the National Capital Planning Commission in 1950 and, was, and that agency was strengthened. The commission would survive and thrive again in no small measure because of the leadership of David A. Finley. As decisions about the Truman renovation interiors became pressing in the spring of 1950, Howell Krim, as chief usher, asserted himself and demanded control of the interiors and their design. David E. Finley, the new chairman of the Commission of Fine Arts, saw the opening with a friend in charge and was able to get a foot in the door for the commission. Finley would obtain invitations to meetings and slowly gain influence and eventually would overcome the embarrassing slight to the Commission of Fine Arts and the legislation authorizing the White House renovation. Persistent, witty, and polite, Finley, a South Carolinian who could spin a funny yarn, was determined to establish a commission back in authority, making decisions about the decorations and the interior design of the White House. In the end, the commission to, to renovate the White House genuinely appreciated his hard work and his valuable advice, <clears throat> and although Finley has had no official role in the project. However, Finley got what he most wanted, official recognition of the, official com of the Commission of Fine Arts. On June 19, 1951, at the suggestion of Krim, Winslow, and Reynolds, the White House Renovation Commission decided to seek approval of all of its designs and plans from the Commission of Fine Arts, which had not been consulted since 1949. After a grand tour of inspection, the commissioners approved the plans, and a gracious letter was sent by Chairman Finley to President Truman, blessing the renovation and, and by it reestablishing the agency's design and review role at the White House. The remarkable career role of David Finley has played no small role in reviving the Commission of Fine Arts into the importance of the cultural life of the nation's capital. And a great chapter was ahead in his collaboration with Jacqueline Kennedy. But that is a story for another time. Thank you very much.